welcome back to Ready Player None, the only podcast that says there's a special place in hell called the throne. In the last episode, we found out the circumstances behind Daito's ridiculous death. His little brother, who's not actually his brother, Shoto, promised revenge. And beyond that, not much else happened. Join me now in chapter 26, when Wade uncovers the riddle of the Jade Key. After Shoto left his hideout, Wade spent a few hours just holding the key and reciting the riddle. Continue your quest by taking the test. The Jade Key, if you remember, came inside a silver foil wrapper. Since the foil conspicuously had its own inventory slot, that's got to be, for the lack of a better word, key to solving the riddle. So Wade's doing all sorts of folding it flat and image analysis and magnification and so on. You're in a video game, why don't you just extract the texture? But other than being silver foil on one side and white paper on the other, it's completely blank. It holds no secrets. I was eating some corn chips at the time, so I was using voice commands to operate the image analysis software. Great. I love it. I love that our hero has such greasy Cheeto fingers that it leads to a plot development. Mwah. Thank you. Thank you for this. Using voice commands is reminding him of a scene from Blade Runner in which the main character Deckard uses something similar to analyse a photograph. You can see where this is going. Contrivance number one is that Wade's greasy fingers lead to this epiphany. Contrivance number two, as the virtual light reflected off its foil surface, I thought about folding the wrapper into a paper aeroplane and sailing it across the room. Why did you think about that? Why is that your natural reaction to that? That made me think of origami, which reminded me of another moment from Blade Runner. As soon as he whispers the word unicorn, the wrapper jumps into the palm of his hand and begins folding itself, until lo and behold there's a little origami unicorn. One of the most iconic images from Blade Runner. I bet Artemis solved this really early because she just happened to say unicorn, because girls like My Little Pony and Artemis is the only outlet Ernest has for listing off TV shows that happen to have female characters in lead roles. So Wade legs it to the Vonnegut ready to take off. Now I knew exactly what test that line referred to, and where I needed to go to take it. The origami unicorn had revealed everything to me. Page break! I've never seen Blade Runner. Sorry, Ben, if you're listening. So this is going to be an especially fun chapter. Either the references are going to completely sail over my head, or they're going to be over-explained to me. Neither one of those is a fun time. So we do get a bit of a potted summary of Blade Runner here. It's referenced in Anorak's Almanac 14 times. It's one of Halliday's top 10 movies. It was written by Philip K. Dick. For these reasons, I'd seen Blade Runner over four dozen times and had memorized every frame of the film and every line of dialogue. Shut up, you anal retentive Wikipedia of a man. While he's in hyperspace, he reviews the director's cut of Blade Runner, which I'm going to assume is the most snobby version, to review two scenes in which the Voigtkampf machines appear. That is one of the things that I had heard about from Blade Runner, but the book helpfully elucidates that Blade Runner is about Harrison Ford's character, Rick Deckard, hunting down and killing replicants. Genetically engineered beings that are almost indistinguishable from real humans. Oh wow. I always thought they were robots. And the only way to spot a replicant is to submit them to a Voigtkampf test. Now in the movie, Voigtkampf machines only appear inside the Tyrell building. And it turns out in the Oasis, Tyrell buildings are really easy to come by. Copies of it existed on hundreds of different planets spread throughout all 27 sectors. This was because the code for the building was included as a free built-in template in the Oasis World Builder construction software, along with hundreds of other structures borrowed from various science fiction films and television series. <sighs> as a consequence, there's hundreds of these Tyrell buildings all over the Oasis, sometimes multiple ones on the same planet. And the nearest planet to Falco is called Axrenox. Blech. Axrenox. Oh, that does not fit in the mouth. <laughs> That's what she said. You know, considering how there's supposed to be thousands of worlds in the Oasis, it's really telling that the only ones we ever visit are the ones containing perfect recreations of things. Wade suspects that the Voigtkampf machines in every Tyrell building contain the entrance to the second gate. And since there's so many of them all over the place, it had spread the Sixers too thin to guard all of them. That's also making a pretty big assumption that these buildings won't be altered by the people who design the planets. We'll see. He touches down on Axe Renox and zones in on the nearest version of the Tyrell building. So he lands the Vonnegut on one of the Tyrell building's landing pads. It's cloaked, so it's invisible. And when he leaves it, he activates all the security systems. Those are the precautions he has to take to avoid being shipjacked. The Vonnegut would be a target for the first leather-clad booster gang that spotted it. Wouldn't it be funny if, because his ship is completely invisible on a landing pad, someone just landed on top of him? <laughs> 
He's got a map of the template of this building, so he finds the nearest lift, and he punches in the default security code. Turns out it's correct. Whoever had created this section of the Axronox cityscape hadn't bothered to reset the security codes in the template. I took this as a good sign. It meant they'd probably left everything else in the template at the default setting too. Well, never mind what I just said about changing things up. When will I learn that, unless it's going to be something stupid like putting an arcade cabinet in the middle of a D&D module, nothing in this book is going to be changed up. He takes the lift to the 440th floor, noting that he's got five security checkpoints and about 50 NPCs between him and the Voigt Kampf machines. The shooting started as soon as the elevator doors slid open, like Blade Runner meets the Matrix. I had to kill seven skin jobs before I could even make it out of the elevator car and into the hallway. Skin jobs? That's what my boyfriend calls my d The next ten minutes played out like the climax of a John Woo movie. One of the ones starring Chow Yun-Fat, like Hard Boiled or The Killer. So again, we know exactly what he's going for here because he spells out what he's going for in the text. I switched both of my guns to auto-fire and held down the triggers as I moved from one room to the next, mowing down every NPC in my path. Oh, look at you, Mr. Amazing Brilliant Sci-Fi Gunsmith. Of course you're going to hit everyone if you have infinite bullets and you're firing all the time. That's not even a joke, he's got infinite bullets. New clips teleport into his guns every time the old ones finish. My bullet bill this month was going to be huge. Shut up. I only missed a few sentences out of that paragraph, but that was ten minutes of gun action. Just glossed over like that. He finds his way to, say it with me, a perfect recreation of the eponymous Tyrell's office. There's an owl in here for some reason? Every detail from the film had been duplicated exactly, so I'm not going to waste anyone's time by describing it to you. Let me describe to you someone else's set design, says Ernest Klein, because I couldn't think of my own. Now the actually relevant part of the set design is that on the conference table there's one of these Voigt Kampf machines which looks like a... which is about the size of a briefcase. It turns itself on as Wade approaches it. A thin robotic arm extended a circular device that looked like a retinal scanner, which locked into place directly level with the pupil of my right eye. So it is a retinal scanner. Why did you say it looks like one if that's the thing it is? It's like me grabbing a banana and saying this looks like a banana. He wonders if an NPC or a perfect recreation of Harrison Ford is going to come along and ask him questions like in the movie. I'd memorised all of her answers just in case. Shut up. What a waste of a memory. He takes out the jade key and the machine reveals a keyhole. Putting the key in the hole makes the machine disappear and replaces it with a second gate on a polished conference table. Like the first one, it seems to open onto a field of stars. And unlike the first one, I don't hold up any hope that Wade is going to asphyxiate in deep space. Page break. What do we think? Blade Runner laser disc challenge? Let's have a look. Oh. Okay. Instead of ending up in Blade Runner, because I suppose that wouldn't be a change of scenery to the rest of the cyberpunk planets that Wade's visited, he's deposited just inside a disco-era bowling alley in Middletown, Halliday's hometown. Or the recreation of Halliday's hometown? The inside of the place is deserted. He can hear a game room full of arcade machines off to the one side. There's a loud howl of wind, and he's slid across the floor towards the arcade room. He must be wearing those bowling alley shoes with no carpet friction. So he's been sucked in through the arcade room. I spotted a dozen video games inside, all from the mid to late 80s. List of video games. But I could now see that my avatar was being drawn toward one game in particular. It's Black Tiger by Capcom. I wonder if it's going to say it. Put a pin in right here. Beep. So the game's monitor is a swirling vortex and it's sucking everything in. Wade grabs onto a nearby joystick and he's lifted off the ground. But he's grinning. And you know why? I was all prepared to pat myself on the back because I'd mastered Black Tiger long ago, during the first year of the hunt. Of course you bloody did. Before Anorak's website showed the scoreboard, it showed a looping animation of him crafting spells and mixing potions and bug ring owls and whatever. In said animation, there was a black dragon painted on the wall. When the hunt started, there was much debate in the Gunter community as to what the black dragon could represent. But Wade is smirking to himself that he always knew what it meant. Black dragon was the name that Black Tiger was released under in Japan. Or as the book puts it here, Buraku Dragon. For God's sake, please stop spelling out things from Katakana. They clearly mean the words that they are. It's not Supider Man, it's not Oratora Man, and it's not Buraku Dragon. It's Spider Man, Ultraman, Black Dragon. I know you think it's exotic, but at the end of the day, what you're putting out there is Japanese man speak funny. 
Black Tiger was an important game to Klein, I mean Halliday, because he used to sneak out to the bowling alley and play it when his parents were screaming at each other. His words, not mine. And Anorax Almanac, I don't know if we've seen this before, I'm sure I would have remembered. It's quoted here like it's a Bible passage. AA 23 colon 234. Ernest Klein's self-inserts book is quoted here like a religious text. That's a lofty ambition, Ernie. The quote is, For one quarter, Black Tiger lets me escape from my rotten existence for three glorious hours. Pretty good deal. Truly, this is an epic religious text. So Wade, the clever dick, used all this to master Black Dragon like Halliday had done, to the point where he could reach the end on just one credit. Now, it looked as if my foresight and diligence were about to pay off. Why are you saying that as if that's a new thought to you? This has happened with literally everything you've turned your hand to. Wade is unable to hold onto his joystick for much longer, and he's sucked off into the Black Tiger dimension. After everything goes black, presumably because it's loading, he finds himself in a narrow dungeon corridor. He's in a 3D remake of Black Tiger, but not 3D in the free roaming sense. To his right hand side there's a black void, like if he were the arcade character that'd be the fourth wall. His avatar has been transformed into the hero of Black Tiger. A muscular, half-naked barbarian warrior dressed in an armoured thong and horned helmet. And he's kitted out like the character as well, including a mace gauntlet and throwing knives. And it's the 30-foot vertical leap that finally tips him off that is inside a video game. I wonder how many employees Halliday had to lay off after the crunch to get this thing coded. Sidebar, but Wade says the game's 50 years old. It's closer to 60 by my count. He could just be talking off-handedly, but it's still a thing I'm pleased to correct him on. He says he's going to need a different set of skills now, compared to playing a 2D side-scroller, but I'm sure he's going to get through it charitably easily. The first gate had placed me inside one of Halliday's favourite movies, and now the second gate had put me inside one of his favourite video games. While I was pondering the implication of this pattern, a message began to flash on my display. Go! Are you not going to say it? Are you actually not going to say it after all this? Right, this is the pin. Pin still in? Pin will be out in a second. So the go flashes on his display, and there's an arrow in the wall next to him telling him to proceed forward. I stretched my arms and legs, cracked my knuckles, and took a deep breath, none of which are really relevant, and only make him seem cool to a non-existent outside observer. And then, yeah, he runs off into the game. Page break. Pin out, we're examining this pin. So, what's the significance of Black Tiger? Well, it's certainly one of Ernest Klein's favourite games. But you know this? And this? are both from Black Tiger. And why did I choose those as the music? Well, the title, Ready Player One, comes from Black Tiger. It is a fundamental building block of this book. And after every perfect recreation and over-explanation, I'm just in disbelief he's not dropped the title in. Self-reference? Oh, that's a bridge too far. I, I cannot get a complete handle on Ernest Cline, even after all these pages. As one might expect, the bulk of Wade's adventure takes place during a page break. It plays out a lot like Black Tiger meets First Person Mario. That's a YouTube video with 23 million views, so don't come to me if you haven't heard of it. Just for variety, we substitute this book's catchphrase, Perfect Recreation, for Faithfully Recreated. This sentence is a little odd to me, actually. Halliday had faithfully recreated every detail of Black Tiger's eight-level dungeon. So is it just one dungeon? With eight levels in it? I don't know, all I know is how to pirate Capcom soundtracks. And as with a lot of these video game playing descriptions, Wade fails at a first hurdle and then finds his groove and succeeds non-stop. We get a list of the types of enemies he's encountered, and how they drop coins that he can trade into wise men to upgrade his items. These wise men apparently thought setting up a small shop in the middle of a monster infested dungeon was a fine idea. Boo! I've never known a thing about Black Tiger before today, but I can already tell that that's a hack comedian's joke about it. That's the hipster version of Chewbacca not getting a medal at the end of Star Wars, which I remind you was in this book, and I did not rip into it as much as I should have done. There's been no way to quit or pause the game, so his only options were either complete it or die. Unfortunately, Wade managed the former. That first hurdle he fell at was the first dungeon boss, the Black Dragon from the website animation. That boss fight took all of his extra lives, so he completed the remaining levels on just one life. That doesn't seem relevant to anything, so the specificity suggests it's some sort of Ernest Cline anecdote. Just under three hours later, he's finished the whole game, and he's teleported back into the arcade room in front of the cabinet. The ending of the game starts to play out, but then something different happens. One of the wise men from the dungeon appeared on the screen, with a speech balloon that said, Thank you, I am indebted to you. Please accept a giant robot as your reward. This is a 12 year old's idea of something cool. Using the joystick on the cabinet, Wade can navigate through icons of different pop culture robots. There were several robots I didn't recognize, but most were familiar. 
I spotted Gigantor, Transor Z, the Iron Giant, Jet Jaguar, the Sphinx-headed giant robo from Johnny Socko and his flying robot, the entire Shogun Warriors toy line, and many of the mechs featured in both the Macross and Gundam anime series. What was that he said? He'd memorised the name of every last goddamn Transformer and Gobot, and yet he doesn't mention any of them here? Wow, did I just call out Ernest Klein for being a fake fan? The gatekeeping in this book is starting to rub off on me. Eleven of the robots of the selection are greyed out with a big X across them. Wade presumes they've already been claimed to other people who've come through here before. That's interesting to me because I thought that they'd somehow faked the scoreboard, but no, they actually have beaten the second gate. Each of the robots has its own stats. Wade seems to be considering which one's the most well-armed, but in the end he goes to the one which he thinks is coolest. Which just sums up the whole thing, doesn't it? I stopped cold when I saw Leopardon, the giant transforming robot used by Spider-Man, the incarnation of Spider-Man who appeared on Japanese TV in the late 1970s. What was I just saying about Spider-Man? I discovered Spider-Man during the course of my research and had become somewhat obsessed with the show. I know! You already said this several chapters ago! I put in a clip from it and everything! He picks Leopard on, and a 12 inch tall replica of it appears on top of the cabinet. It's added to his inventory, but it doesn't have a description or instructions. With that out of the way, the Black Tiger cabinet starts playing the credits. I respectfully read each of the programmer's names. That's me making a jerk off motion with my hand. They were all Japanese except for the very last credit which read Oasis Port by JD Halliday. So is the implication here that Halliday not only coded the entire game by himself but also scores of giant robots? No wonder it doesn't have a description, he didn't have any QC testers. Wade benefits from sticking around to see an after credits sequence. A glowing red circle with a five pointed star appears on the display. In the centre of this circle star an image of the crystal key appears. I felt a rush of adrenaline because I recognised the red star symbol and I knew where it was meant to lead me. Communist Russia. He snaps a bunch of screenshots and when the cabinet powers down it's replaced by the exit gate. I let out a triumphant cheer and jumped through it. End chapter 26. There you have it, Jade Key Riddle solved much quicker than the previous riddle. It's strange how Blade Runner was just window dressing. A means of conveyance to get from A to B. Cyberpunk as a genre owes so much to it and... This is a cyberpunk book that spends a mere four pages paying homage to it. Speaking of replicants, the first person version of Black Tiger replicates some of my complaints about the 3D version of Zork. I suppose it might be an interesting idea to play a 2D side scroller in first person. I rate that shrug out of 10. That's a much more loving homage to what's clearly Ernest Cline's favourite game. But all things considered, it doesn't spend much time in the game world. That crack about the wise men clearly didn't get enough laughs at his last slam poetry gig. Again and again, these chapters prove to be just a means of conveyance for Ernest to tell you about the things he likes. Next time consider writing a guidebook, or a memoir, because I've had enough of the fictional trappings. If you want more from someone who spends too much time reinterpreting other people's famous works, you can follow me on Twitter, at the Last Gherkin, or follow the show on Twitter at rpn underscore pod. Watch with subtitles on YouTube, The Last Gherkin, or get an mp3 download at thelastgherkin.podbean.com. Unless I refuse to pay hosting money to Podbean by this point in time, join us next time as, God willing, we reach the point where we'll have 100 pages left. This is the home stretch. List of video games. But I could now see that the <laughs> Wade is unable to hold onto his joystick for that long and he's sucked off into the Black Tiger <laughs> dimension. <laughs> There's a lot of dicks in this episode.